Hello everyone. In this video, I will walk you through a process I experimented with to create this custom Koenigsegg inspired key fob that works for my car. It's made from pre-preg carbon fiber, molded from dental stone, made from a 3D printed model that houses my old car circuitry, all to control my car. Yes, there are a lot of technical aspects to this process, but I will explain all of the methods and reasonings I used alongside each appropriate section of this video. But to give a quick introduction, I will first acquire a 3D model of the general shape that I want, then 3D print and modify it so that it can house the functional parts of my old key fob. Then I'll create a compressive mold from dental stone. Lastly, I'll layer the mold with pre preg carbon fiber and bake them to get two shell halves that I can assemble into a functional key fob. I'll start by finding a suitable 3D model as I don't want to design my own. Looking up Koenigsegg key on Google led me to this specific file on cults3d.com which seemed to be modeled after a Yesco key fob. Link for that in the description. One side of this model has a raised emblem, but the other is flat, which allows me to easily modify that side to mount the circuit board and button pad. Using Kura, I printed a variety of scaled models to see which one was the most ergonomical in my hand, while still being big enough to house the circuit board. 7 centimeters was the height I settled on. I then need to figure out the best print orientation. I need maximum resolution, especially for the emblem face, so I oriented the model vertically, so that I don't get obvious layer lines. I will also need to make two models, each contributing to one half of the final assembly, just like my old key fob. You might ask why I'm making this model hollow instead of solid. Normally, a single negative mold would be extracted from the print, and a vacuum bag would be used to compress the carbon while it cures. But since this project is on a budget, I don't want to purchase an entire vacuum bag setup. Rather, I'm choosing the compression mold technique, this is where I'll extract both a negative and a positive mold to compress the carbon fiber while it cures. Basically, this means that every layer of the model will be replaced with some number of sheets of the carbon. A print layer is about 500 microns across, while a carbon fiber layer is about 300. So I'll need the least common multiple between them, or close to. Coincidentally, the thickness of the raised emblem at this scale was about 300 microns, so that's one layer prepreg. I want three layers of carbon for the main assembly to balance strength with resources, so I had to choose two shell walls for the model. The 100 micron difference will be eliminated once the carbon is compressed. The two prints will be used to create four molds total, one positive and one negative for each of the two assembly halves. I found this template online and it helped me center the button pad on the flat side, so I'll be able to cut an outline into the face so that it can sit flush with the model. Then on the underside, I need to fix in some material to mount the circuit board, yet allow the button pad to work properly. So I used a thin piece of plastic from a strawberry container, as too thick of a material and the buttons won't touch. This is the same setup as my old key fob, but the mounting piece wasn't reusable. I used some hot glue to offset the piece by the thickness of the button pad so that it could be molded correctly, but it did need adjusting later on. For the emblem piece, I will also make the main body from three solid layers of prepreg. But due to the way that print was hollowed out in Kura, there is an inverted gap in the shape of the emblem on the underside they need to get rid of. So I opted to fill in these valleys with some modeling clay. The uniformness would allow me to get even compression over the entire piece and prevents distortion of the carbon by not having to force it against the sharp corners. To get a good finish on the final piece, I tried to smooth out the layer lines by sanding the prints before casting them. This didn't work too well, so I opted to fill in the gaps with modeling clay. In hindsight, a better printer would have made things a lot less complicated here and later. To ready the models for casting, I sprayed some epoxy mold release on both sides, but I should have probably used some PVA release instead. Still, link in the description. To cast the negative mold from the printed shells, I made a small box from sheet plastic. I then mixed some dental stone with water to pour around the model to make the mold. I did need a few counterweights to keep the model from floating and have it sit flush with the top of the gypsum. There are a few reasons that led me to experiment with this material for this project. Firstly, I don't find it cost effective to design and machine a mold out of cast aluminum for a one-off piece. A 3D printed negative mold might work well if done correctly, 
but because I'm using prepreg carbon fiber, the mold will not survive a 120 degrees Celsius oven. Secondly, there is an option of using epoxy resin, and though I have some laying around, it tends to be expensive to purchase, especially in small quantities, and it is not repairable in the case that you make a mistake during the casting process. Most importantly, however, a lot of epoxy resins will soften up at high temperatures, which would not work for prepreg. For these reasons, I decided to try using a material for the mold that is not too well known called dental stone. This comes in the form of a powder that is used by dentists to create extremely accurate and tough impression molds from patients' teeth. Unlike plaster of Paris, it does not break apart just by looking at it, and as long as you cast it with a thickness of about 1 cm or more, it can withstand a lot of force. This makes it ideal for my use case because it is extremely cheap, about $10 to $15 a pound. But also, if there are any issues with the surface finish, such as air bubbles that got stuck, you can easily repair the mold by filling in the gaps with more dental stone. If there are any raised bumps casted from the 3D model, you can scrape those away with some small tools to get a perfect finish. The point is, the mold is repairable, and any mistakes you make can be worked out instead of having to make a new one from scratch. It is also a lot less messy and sticky than epoxy resin, it can survive high temperatures, and it doesn't really smell. All you have to do is mix it with some water and pour. There are a few disadvantages, however. One being that the material is porous. This means that I need to apply some sort of sealant to the surface so that the epoxy flowing from the prepreg does not get into the pores and end up ripping the mold apart. In my case, I did have to break the mold anyway to get the pieces out, so this material may end up being a one-time use. Dental stone comes in a few types, with type 1 being soft and type 5 being the hardest. I use type 3 and type 4, and both of them seem to work well. I provided a link in the description of where I purchased them from. Now that the molds are smoothed out, I prepared the surface so that I can layer it with carbon fiber. I experimented with a few different materials, but it seems that a PVA based solution might work the best. Although PVA is not recommended for use with high temperature, it still seems to withstand the curing process. Wood glue is PVA based, and I had some, so I just mixed it with some water to thin it out and applied it over the entire surface of the gypsum. Any excess water is absorbed into the mold, so that's not an issue once the epoxy starts to set. I'm sure there is a better solution than this one, I just don't know what it is. After drying, the surface is noticeably shiny and has formed a strong layer. So I then sprayed three layers of the epoxy mold release and let it dry. One thing to note is that I excessively smoothed out the mold to the point where there was some distortion on the surface. This didn't need to happen, and if my printer was properly calibrated, Perhaps the surface wouldn't need any sort of repair. Now onto the prepreg carbon. Staying true to the aesthetic of Koenigsegg, I wanted to include the V design that you can see on the hoods of their cars. This is what I'll do for both key fob halves, and I want to make the emblem also line up with the pattern so that it can blend in at certain angles. You might be wondering at this point, what is prepreg carbon fiber and why am I using it for this project? Prepreg is simply carbon fiber cloth that has been pre-saturated with an epoxy resin that is formulated to cure with heat rather than time. This means that you are not time restricted after normally mixing your epoxy resin and brushing it on your cloth, but rather you bake the prepreg so that it can solidify whenever you are ready. This way I don't have to worry about evenly mixing epoxy resin then carefully infusing it into the cloth. The work has been done for me and I can take my time to ensure that all the layers are aligned correctly. Prepreg is a relatively new technology that can have a long shelf life as long as it's stored in a basic freezer. It can be bought online for relatively cheap, and it avoids additional complexities with making parts such as having to use resin flow tubes or improper mixing of the resin. The prepreg you see me cut out is somewhat tacky, which allows it to stick to the mold and to other pieces of itself. This avoids the use of gel coat, which is needed for regular carbon cloth. But the most important reason that I'm using prepreg over regular cloth is because dry cloth is unstable in smaller pieces. The toes fray off very easily at the edges and the pattern distorts with the slightest movement. Since I'm prioritizing the aesthetics of this piece, it's more practical to work with prepreg, where I'm able to make precise cuts without any fraying and I can easily line up the edges without any accidental overlap or distortions. I got this roll from AliExpress, link in the description. After layering all the carbon, I placed the positive mold to sandwich the prepreg and then clamped it down. 
but the clamp should have a spring to it because as the resin flows it will take up less space and I want to keep constant pressure on the layers so that I don't end up with air pockets. I settled on some small eight clamps from an old battery charger. I also tried reusing some of the blue plastic film that used to cover the carbon and placed it between the mold. And this seems to work really well without melting, so perhaps a thinner version of this material can be used as a separator. To cure the prepreg, I placed the molds into my toaster oven and set the temperature to 70 degrees Celsius. This allows the resin to slowly warm up and begin to shift into place, so this cycle is run for about 3 hours. Afterwards, the temperature is raised to 120 degrees Celsius so that the resin may harden. This is run for about an hour and a half. The molds are removed and allowed to cool to room temperature so that I can extract the pieces safely. There is also a small potential to distort the pieces if they are demolded while still hot, so it's best for them to cool at this point, unlike what you do if you were baking cookies. In this case, it took a lot of work to break away the gypsum, and the surface was slightly rough. But this was just the wood glue that was stuck to the piece, so I soaked in a bit of vinegar and water and was able to rub the softened glue away. One thing I quickly realized was the slight difference in overall length between the two pieces. This was my fault as I excessively scraped away the corner of the mold while I was attempting to smooth it out. I wanted to see if I can try to replicate the naked carbon look from Koenigsegg, where the epoxy on top of the carbon is sanded down until you reach the bare strands, resulting in a chrome shine. I used some solvent to remove what I can from the top layer of epoxy off the pieces. For this piece, I believe it was not properly cured due to the thickness of the gypsum not allowing the heat to reach the center. So I ended up stripping away almost all of the epoxy that was residing in the top layer. This gave a really nice look, and I would have liked to keep the piece looking this way, but that caused some of these strands to start peeling. So I decided to re-cure it, and then mix up some resin to put a top coat on both pieces. When pouring, I do need to make sure that the epoxy does not have any trapped air bubbles, so I use my heat gun to pop them after mixing and after pouring to prevent cloudiness. For the first layer, I included some silver glitter powder so that I can give a sort of diamond encrusted look to the carbon, just like you would find on some special Koenigsegg vehicles. This ended up being difficult to notice unless looking at the key fob very closely, but it was worth a shot. I poured three to four coats of tabletop epoxy that I had, and in between each coat, I waited until the epoxy was only slightly tacky before adding the next one on top, with each coat needing three days to cure. After the final layer, there were some slight bumps and uneven patches, so I proceeded to smooth out the surface starting with 100 grit sandpaper. Then I worked my way up to 400, at which point I began wet sanding. Then 600, then 1200, and increments of 2000 all the way up to 10,000 grit. But to finish it off with a mirror surface, I used some of this Meguiar's compound to polish the surface with a cheap buffer wheel. This did take a good 5-10 to 10 minutes of intense buffing as the epoxy does cure to a tough finish, but it was good enough afterwards to move on to the final step. For the circuit board side, I had planned on the prepreg becoming the support material to hold up the circuit board, but since it did not cure correctly, I removed it and replaced it with a wide piece of the same plastic I used before which seemed to work well. I tested out this ultraviolet curing resin that I also bought from AliExpress, and it turned out to be pretty neat. Apply some like regular glue, but at the point that you need it to harden, shine a UV LED on it for about 15 seconds, and it cures. I also used this when sanding the surfaces, as sometimes I would go a bit too far, and I didn't want to wait three days for another pour. Since the plastic was clear, I was able to glue it to the back side of it, and it seemed to hold up well. Then the circuit board was aligned and glued on as well. On the flip side, I test fit the button pad to make sure that all the buttons work, then glued it on with some contact cement glue. Now, I don't want to carry this key fob around by itself, so I need to add some sort of attachment point so that it can be a part of my keychain. I took the small metal ring off of my old key fob and made these two slits into the shell walls so that I can glue it from the inside. I also made the same splits on the other half so that it could be centered. Some more of that UV resin and now I'm ready to glue the halves together. I didn't want a permanent connection between the halves since I might need to replace the battery in a few years, so I opted to use some black gasket maker. This is very durable but could also be removed with a small knife. After that dried, I decided to fill in the gap with some more epoxy since I wanted the edges to be smooth, but it is still peelable if I tried. 
Well, that's it for this project. I'd say this was more of a proof of concept than anything, with plenty of room for improvement throughout the process. One detail that did bother me was part of the background that did not perfectly align with the emblem, but not much I can do there. If one were to replicate something like this on a commercial scale, I'd imagine there'd be quite an interest for it from car enthusiasts, because let's be honest here, who doesn't like Koenigsegg? Well, it's a start. Thanks for watching.